Thanks, Stephanie. And uh, thank you, everyone, for taking some time out of your afternoon today to chat about uh, doing some curriculum review and revision and, and some of the ways that you can use data to help with that. It's, I feel like it's a really relevant topic. It's something that, as I, uh, my experience in the health sciences um, education, I went through this. I knew lots and lots of schools that were, and the more that we get out there at different conferences and, and speak to schools, we're hearing that this is happening all over the place. So I'll give you a little bit of insight into you know what we can do and how we can maybe help with that, as well as some things from my own experiences in going through a curricular revision. So the agenda for this afternoon, um, some of the forces behind the change, talking about why this is happening a little bit, what are some of the most common themes of curricular redesign and revision. I've broken them down a little so that you can kind of see the three or four most common things that we're hearing from schools and some of the challenges associated with those. Um, some of them, you know, really overlap a lot. Some of them are very, you know, kind of segmented and independent of each other. So uh, we'll walk through them all. What we can do to help if you are using us already as a software vendor, if you're not using us already, um, what are some of the things that having a system like ours and the data that can come from it can really help and how that can be a part of this process for you. And then some small examples of when I went through this and some of the things that we saw and some of the things that we were able to accomplish and some of the things that we weren't able to accomplish. So, And then we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, again, like Stephanie said, if you have some questions, toss them into that little side chat window, uh, and then Stephanie will feed them to me at the end and we'll go through them all. So kind of starting off with why change? There's, there's pressure from all kinds of different angles to change curriculum. Sometimes just because it's been this way for 40 or 50 years and everybody's woken up and said, hey, maybe just because it's been this way for 40 or 50 years doesn't mean it should stay the same. Sometimes it's pressure from accreditors. There's been a real solid shift in the last several years um, to, towards focus on learning outcomes and making sure that you're measuring learning outcomes and students are achieving and attaining those things. Um, the best practices are changing. What was the best practice in education 10 years ago isn't the best practice anymore. Uh, and that's partly because of technology and teaching methods and, and a lot of different things that are evolving in education. Board exams are increasing their passing criteria. It seems like left and right. Every time I talk to a nursing school, I hear about how the NCLEX is going up again, or med schools, how USMLE is raising the step one and step two standards. I believe there's been like four or five raises in the last 10 years of the step one standards for medical schools. Um, and student expectations are changing too. Uh, students are coming in with a whole different mindset when they're entering programs and they want to know um, they want to know that they're going to receive the type of education they're looking for, one that you know is embedded in technology, one that gives them the sort of feedback and control they're used to having about things, uh, that it, it allows them to be a lot more self-directed. And then, you know, lastly, I think if you talk to enough deans out there, you'll find out that some of them will say, yeah, I'm not doing it for any of those reasons. I'm doing it because everyone else is and I've got to keep up. So uh, whatever reason it's happening, there's a lot of different forces behind the change uh, to redesign curriculums. Some of the common themes of curricular redesign, some of the ones we see most frequently. Um, taking an individual course-based uh, curriculum and turning it into an integrated one. Uh, making it more of a, a, a case-based system, a competency-based system, whatever it is. Um, taking those things from segmented groups and putting them into one integrated course or program. Uh, like I said, con converting to competency-based curriculum. And sometimes that's just a, a matter of changing assessment, but sometimes that's a matter of changing the entire curriculum um, and having to change your assessment at the same time to be able to really go to competency-based. And competency-based is probably the most common and most popular uh, curricular reform that I hear about and that I work with schools who are doing. Trying to realign the curriculum to have the content better reflect the board exam requirements as different emphasis comes out, as certain content makes its way in and out of board exams as they re refine those things no matter what you're in. Um, and to you know make sure that you're, you're keeping up with those changes because they're happening so quickly. Changing the delivery of your curriculum to integrate new forms of teaching and technology. Uh, kind of going back to those student expectations and what are the best practices. Uh, sometimes you've got to reform your curriculum because you've got to put podcasting, you've got to put e-learning modules and all these things, and that changes the way you teach, and that changes the way you assess, and it changes what you measure, and all kinds of other different things. And so uh, really just changing nothing but the delivery methods can have a lot of different impacts and consequences uh, and causes a lot of work for curriculums as they adapt to today's technology. And simply reordering the content. Uh, one of the things that I'm hearing uh, also semi-frequently is we're just trying to find the best way to fit all these pieces and parts together. Maybe you've had an integrated curriculum for a while, you were, you were one of the earlier adopters of that, or, or maybe you know, your curriculum 
is in a pretty solid shape, but you know, maybe it doesn't make as much sense to teach this curriculum in the first semester of the first year as you thought it did. And you want to move it to, you know, the second semester of the third year and you want to rearrange some things and, and try and meld that content a little bit better and give it, make it a little bit more logical or, or make it progress a little bit easier. There's a lot of unintended consequences and maybe collateral damage that can come out of that um, as well. One of the most important things to know and one of the things that I think people struggle with and I know I struggled with as we went through this was Know your intentions. When you're going through curricular redesign, knowing your intentions is really important. What are the outcomes you're looking for um, from the changes that you're making? So very specifically, not broader like, oh, I'd like better retention or I'd like better board scores. That's great. Um, but something more specific than that, a breakdown, something that you can really measure yourself against. And you have a plan for measuring that. You can do all this work on a curricular review and then say, okay, how do I know if this worked or not? Uh, and if you find yourself in a position where you don't know whether or not it worked or not, you're going to end up waiting until that first round of board scores comes in. And when the first round of board scores finally hits, that's when you're going to find out. And at that point, you've been in this new curriculum for a couple of years, and you might have some pretty large deficits that you've got to overcome. So being able to you know, have an early warning system sort of as well. The other thing about knowing your intentions is do you have a baseline? Uh, can you measure against historical data and st statistics in the system? You have um, subject area breakdowns of how students have performed in different subjects across time. Uh, do you have competency breakdowns? Do you have learning outcome performance of the students in your old way of doing the curriculum so that you can compare that? If you don't, uh, you, you're going to have to measure against that intention. And so what are the desired changes I'm seeing and set that as your baseline and start to look for you know, you know, maybe it is an increase, but something a little bit more broad, you can't get a specific because you don't have that past data. So you set something as, okay, I I'd like to see a 5% increase in um, board passage rate, or maybe it's, um, you know, any number of different things. But can you measure those things? Do you have the stats to do it? Uh, and a couple of things, if you are a client of ours, I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, how even if you haven't been using some of the tools I'm going to show you, you can still use them and get that historical data. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. So where do we fit into all of this? Um, you know, some of you on the call today are clients of ours, and we're so thankful for that. And some of you uh, here today are just considering, you know, what does it look like to go through curricular review, and how can maybe different softwares help me with that, or what impact can they really have? So I'm going to take you through the challenges of some of these different methods of, uh, of curricular overhaul, or these different themes of curricular overhaul, and I'll go through some of the different ways that we can help with that. One of the, some of the big challenges about becoming an integrated curriculum are that you don't know how your students are doing in a specific subject anymore. Maybe you used to have an anatomy course and a pathology course and a biochemistry course and so on, and now you've got a, a organ system-based curriculum, or maybe you've got a case-based curriculum, and you've lost some of that nitty-gritty detail about performance and saying, okay, how are my students really doing in X subject? Uh, whereas before, it was very easy to just point to a very specific course score for the students, and the courses were all in their own little silos, and you could go take a look at it broken down any which way you want it. The other thing is that when you do put all these things together and integrate them, are you really distributing your assessment across all the integrated components the way you intended? One of the most frequent things that can happen if you're not careful is that as you start to put all these things together and you begin to assess, entire threads aren't a, a part of the assessment. They're just missed. Uh, and they're really, you know, it's not as easy to recognize that an important topic area or an important subject or a board subject area, whatever it is, that those things are missing completely from your assessments that when you put them together and yeah, you've got some biochemistry in every course and some pathology and physiology in every course, you, you forget some of those in the assessment and they're not a part of it anymore. And so now not only do you not have those course scores, but are you really making sure you assess all of the things that you integrated together? Or are you only, are you only assessing some of the things that you integrated and now you've got some gaps in performance um, you know, metrics? Do you need to tweak the distribution of instruction time? One of the tough things to know when you're taking something from having its very own course with carved out, cemented specific time specifically for that topic is to say, okay, now that we've integrated all this, am I spending too much time on this, not enough time on that? Um, you know, how do you make sure that you're giving it the appropriate distribution you need? And then the last thing is the sample size for student performance in each area becomes a lot smaller um, on an exam by exam basis and it's too small to draw conclusions. If you used to have a pathology exam of 100 items or a, a biochemistry one of 100 items, 
you knew pretty much how they were doing in those areas, kind of tying back to their course scores and those things. But now you've got five or ten items in each exam about those things, and five or ten items doesn't necessarily give you the performance information you're looking for. If I get two out of five on a subject area in an exam, does that really mean that I have a problem with that subject area, or were those three questions I missed in that area just really, really tough? So those things are all some challenges around becoming integrated. Here's how we can help with some of those things. You can link the questions in your assessments to specific subject areas to get reports on student performance. So every single question in our system can be tied to specific learning outcomes, board topic areas, an unlimited number of things. You can tag as many things as you possibly want. And so when you link those things, you can then get performance uh, reports that will show, okay, in block one of our curriculum, the student performed at a you know 78% level on pathology, 62% on anatomy, 80% on pathology, 90% on physiology. And so you can start to get to that data that you lost. The, the, the course level data where you had a, a score for each course, you can now start to pull that out of exams through tagging the questions. Now you know whether or not you have a student who has a weak area um, and and they know you know what their strengths and what their weaknesses are and they most importantly know what their strengths and what their weaknesses are so that they don't hum along getting an 80 percent in every single block and they're missing a hundred percent of the pathology questions in every single block and they have no idea because oh, I'm getting an 80 and doing pretty well but there's there's threads there that they're really suffering in and they wouldn't know it but now you have these reports so you would know it you can also use exam blueprinting to kind of solve that issue about making sure your exams are balanced and that nothing's missing uh, when you tag questions with categories and you start to build an assessment, you get a blueprint, and that blueprint shows you the breakdown of all the content and categories used. So if you take a look at it and you've got you know eight different subject areas integrated in your curriculum that are all supposed to be on this exam, and you see that you've got you know 30 questions from subject area one, 30 questions from subject two, 20 questions in subject three, and you got two questions on subject four and five. You know, you got to do some, some tweaking there. You got to remove some questions, add some questions, something to balance that out a little better. Maybe subjects four and five aren't even there. So when you take a look, you say, oh, hey, we're missing giant gaps of content are no longer a part of our uh, exam here. We got to make sure that we're assessing this so that it doesn't get lost in our integration. You can use that class level performance to figure out whether or not you're, you're allocating the right time to each of those subject areas. So as you integrate and you're taking a look at these things, each student can see their performance individually, but you can take a look at the class performance on the whole and say, all right, well, of our five or six or eight, however many subject areas that we've got represented in this block, uh, our performance is telling us that these three are performing really well, these two are performing average, and these two are really suffering and really performing poorly. And then you can make the decision, you have the data then to make the decision to say, okay, I'm going to take you know, a week away from these two topics and spend it on these. I'm going to have a TA run a review session on this topic. I'm going to do some supplemental activities, some supplemental readings, and, and some optional things to give to the students about these couple of subject areas because we're not, we're not getting the performance we'd like. And you can allocate that precious time that you have more accurately, and you can have some data to help you drive how you're allocating that as you first determine how you put these pieces and parts together. Eventually, yeah, you'll fall into a groove and it'll, you'll, you'll have the right allocation or close to it, but at first it can be very difficult to figure that out. And the last thing you can do is take a look at a longitudinal analysis. You can take a look at the longitudinal analysis for the students on a course level or a student level. What the longitudinal analysis does is it allows you to take a look across assessments at how students are doing in categories. You know, I've gotten 25 out of 30, I've gotten 70 out of 100, whatever it is in those different subject areas, and that gives you the ability to um, know whether or not you're really struggling in that area. Whereas that single assessment sample size might be too small to really say yes or no, I have a weakness in this area. Once you start looking at it and adding that up, you get to a significant end 
uh, so that you really do know how your students are performing. Competency-based curriculum has some of the same challenges of, of going integrated, uh, but it has some, some of its own as well. Measuring that achievement across time is another one of those, kind of like what we were just talking about with longitudinal analysis, being able to kind of watch students as they progress and make sure that they're on a trajectory to meet that minimal competency that you set. And that you, you're, you have to be able to watch this across time, you have to be able to track and monitor their performance in each of the individual competencies and make sure that they are on pace and on target so that you don't get to the end and find students who have huge deficiencies that it's too late to fix, so that you can address those deficiencies as they begin to present themselves. Um, that's a really tough thing to do. Multi-competency assessment is pretty hard as well. A lot of institutions that I talk to take entire assessment scores and attribute them to competencies. And so when you're taking a look at saying, all right, well, I've got three competencies in this assessment, if you don't have the right tools, trying to do multi-competency assessment where, you're, where you parse out that information can be tough. And if you take a single assessment that may have more than one competency in it, and you attribute the entire student score on that assessment towards that competency, you've got noise in your signal. You've got things that are influencing the student's performance in that competency, and they shouldn't be influencing that student's performance because in reality, they in particular weren't part of that competency, other items within that exam were. Competency-based remediation is tough as well because as you go through and you've got a student who is falling short in one or two competencies and you're trying to figure out how to correct for that, if you don't know, if you don't have the ability to really build up to that significant end, it's hard to find out where they're struggling. And then there's a variety of assessment types that are necessary for doing competency-based assessment. It's really difficult to do competency-based assessment with just multiple choice questions. Uh, it's hard. Um, some would say it's impossible. It's, a, it's a definitely a debatable topic. But uh, it's a lot harder if you're limited in how you can do your assessment. Now, the difficulty comes in where, OK, I'm going to do a bunch of forms of assessment to accomplish the variety I need to really assess my students on the competencies, other forms of assessment besides multiple choice are much, much more difficult to get data out of. It's a lot easier to tag questions in multiple choice and then parse out which questions contributed to which category and start to get to some data than it is when you've got when you're using clinicals, when you're using in-class observation, when you're using um, you know, any number of different things, when you're doing papers, when you're doing uh, presentations, projects, that's a lot harder to derive very specific data out of. And so the variety of assessment becomes a big challenge when you're going competency-based. We can help with some of these things. And, and these are, you know, as I talk about how we can help, these are the tools I used when I did this when I was with Ohio State. We help by doing a few different things. You can tag those competencies um, as categories to receive those competency subscore from each assessment. So that multi-competency problem is very similar to the multi-subject area problem for an integrated curriculum. And, and there's a lot of overlap in how you would address that, but by, ca by categorizing those things, you can get those competency subscores so that when you take the student's performance, you're only taking the part that contributed to that competency and tallying it towards their overall competency and meeting that minimum competency. You're not taking the whole assessment score with all that noise I was talking about. You're taking just the piece that matters. You can also use the, the student's performance by competency data to remediate those students. Um, if you combine the student performance by competency with that longitudinal I was, uh, analysis I was talking about, that allows you to do that tracking of students across time. And the, the ability to do that tracking of students across time allows you to, one, solve the problem of making sure they're on the right trajectory, but two, as they fall short of that trajectory and they need remediation, you can use that to build to a significant end so that you're not remediating the two out of five on an exam. Uh, so many schools take each individual assessment sub-competency scores and remediate based on those. In reality, that's, that's going to cause you a lot of unnecessary remediation. It's really once you combine across a bunch of assessments and get to a significant end that says, I have a problem, that's where you should focus your intervention and your resources for doing that, not so much on a, okay, I got two out of five, I got three out of seven, I got four out of eight on one assessment. It doesn't really mean anything. The, the, the variety of assessment type problem is really more towards, is a, is a tough issue, and we have a rubrics, issue, uh, rubrics 
solution that can help with that issue. And what you can do with rubrics, and, and that's rather unique with our system, is that each row of a rubric can be tagged to separate learning outcomes, competencies, subject areas, so that when a student does a paper, when they do a project or a presentation, when you're evaluating them in a clinical scenario, when you're evaluating them in the classroom, whatever you're doing to assess all the different competencies, you can make sure the rubric you're using, only the lines of the rubric and the ratings on the rubric that pertain to that specific competency get included. It's a way of doing that same categorization we talked about on the multiple choice questions, where only the certain multiple choice questions that pertain to a competency count towards that competency. You can start to derive that competency specific data without getting all the noise in other forms of assessment, and it opens it up. Then the real kicker to all of it is, and I think the most powerful thing, is to be able to then take the multiple choice performance in each category or competency or subject area and combine it with the rubric category, competency, subject area performance. So that you can take a look at your students and say, across 12 different assessments, there were maybe 52 multiple choice items that were used. There was three lines on this rubric and two lines on that rubric and one line on this other rubric. And it's gonna pull all the individual specific pieces and parts together and say, on this competency, this is how this student is performing on all assessments. And it frees you up to do those other forms of assessment but still gather that specific competency data. And it allows you to get a 360 degree view of your students rather than just one type of assessment view of your students. Being able to reflect the board and licensure exam is obviously a very important thing. And there's some challenges associated with that because of the increased increasing passing criteria, the, the, the content that's making its way in and out of those exams as they reform it. And some of it is, is on a more macro level when you take a look at changing your curriculum to meet these things. And sometimes it's a question type and a style. Um, maybe it's, it's, there's only certain level of questions being asked in a, uh, in a licensure exam compared to what's in the rest of your curriculum. Maybe you need to map the content between the licensure exam and your curriculum to make sure that you're spending the appropriate amount of time on each thing to make sure you have 100% coverage of all the content that is going to be covered in the board exam. And then the other challenge here is to try to provide your students with feedback that assists in their preparation that gives them a guide to what they need to do to perform better on their licensure exams. And changing your curriculum to fit these things and then changing your assessment to meet that, it can be a little bit tough. Everything seems to come back to categories and, and I, I, I hope you're picking that trend up because really it's all a variation of using categories. In this case, we're looking at instead of competencies or subject areas, we're looking at categorized questions by whether they're a board question type or not. It's sometimes not possible to get every question in your curriculum rewritten into a board style all at once. That takes time and effort and, and energy and resources. So start to differentiate your, between the ones that are in a board style format, whether that's a clinical vignette versus a recall question, or maybe it's higher level of Bloom's taxonomy questions in your curriculum versus lower level of Bloom's taxonomy questions. You can start to differentiate those at least for what you have as you work on changing the items themselves and then you can take a look at performance differences and say, hey, are we masking our performance here? Do, is our students performing at an 88% average on all of our exams, um, but they're struggling with the board style questions within that and they're doing well on the recall questions. And so we need to increase the number, we need to increase the quality, we need to make those reforms and we need to see how we're doing towards making those reforms in order to help our students perform better and be re better prepared for those licensure style questions. The other thing is to take a look at your assessments and say, okay, does the distribution of cognitive levels or blooms within our exams match what our board and our licensing body is doing? Or does it not? Do we have a, a big gap there that we need to work on? You can also take a look at the distribution of questions and categories to ensure proper coverage and difficulty. Take that content coverage, make sure you're covering the same content in, in just as much as they are in the licensure exam within your curriculum but also make sure that as you're covering that content, you're covering it to the correct difficulty level. And then I think the real key thing, and one of the things that our students found most helpful and was most popular was being able to give the students performance data that they can use to direct their study time when it comes to board study time. 
So we gave our students several weeks off at the end of the curriculum to go out and study for the boards and, and take that time and really focus on just that. We cleared, you know, everything from the curriculum stops for a little while. Well, because we were monitoring their performance on all the specific board areas, and we were monitoring their performance on board style questions versus non-board style questions, they were left with a roadmap at the end of the curriculum that said, of the 20 subject areas on the boards, here are the five you're struggling with, the five you're averaging, the 10 you're really excelling in. And they could take that and translate it into a study schedule. They're gonna spend an extra week or two on these topics and take a few days away from that topic. They can, maybe it's the style of studying. Are they, do they really need to work on the content or do they really need to work on applying the content? Because maybe they know it really well, their knowledge level is really high, they're doing well in all the subject areas, but they're struggling when it comes to those application level questions. So maybe they need to focus on more practice questions than content studying during their preparations for the boards. Whatever it is, you give them a data point, you give them a blueprint for how they need to approach these things and it makes them more effective and you're just kind of handing it over, you're doing what you did anyway, you're giving the same assessments you always gave, but you're providing more information to your students without really taking the time to make your faculty sit down and help the students figure out each of these individual things. Changing the de delivery method can be I think one of the most difficult things and one of the most controversial because the, the old, if it's not broke, don't fix it, and, and lots of faculty members can sometimes get a little stuck in their ways and say, hey, you know, I've been teaching it this way for 20 years, and my students have always done well, and I shouldn't change, and I'm not going to change. You know, there's validity and there's lack of validity to a lot of those different points, but you have to take a look at what's, what the style of learners that are coming into education today and make sure that you're meeting their needs. And some of the challenges behind meeting their needs is putting in new delivery methods like podcasting or e-learning modules or self-directed learning and making sure it's actually still effective. And just because it's not at first doesn't mean that it won't be eventually. But there, you know, you, you've spent 20 years refining that lecture that's been given every single year. It's going to take some time. You're going to have to figure out whether or not the new delivery methods are effective. And then you have to take a look at, okay, if it's not effective, is it the method itself, is this not an effective method of delivery? Is this new te technolo technological wonder thing not actually the greatest thing in the world? Or is it that certain topics, certain subjects, certain things fit better with certain delivery methods than with other delivery methods? And so you need to make sure that you're adapting to that and saying, okay, you know what, this really still needs to be an in-person standard old lecture where they can ask questions and there's interaction. But these things actually do lend themselves to, uh, you know, maybe it's a podcast or maybe it's a, a e-learning module. And make sure you, you're identifying which ones are most effective and eliminating what's not. Not everything is going to work. It's the ability to recognize and change when you find it's not working that's going to be really important. When you're taking a look at these new delivery methods or the incorporating technology, changing how you're going to deliver your curriculum, you can take a look at th things in a variety of ways. You can use historical item analysis and take a look at, okay, these same items that we've been using for years and we've got stats built up in the system because the system retains item analysis data from every assessment that it was ever used on and every, um, every version it was ever uh, made of it. So if you make edits, it versions the questions for you and gives you item analysis data about each specific version. You can use all of that information to say, okay, we, we're using the same items we used before, but we taught something differently. Did our item analysis on these items change from the old delivery method to the new delivery method? If it did, did it change for the positive? Did it change the direction we wanted it to go, or did it not? Um, some people would go so far as to tag questions with what their delivery method was. And so maybe there's 100 questions in an exam, and 30 come from the learning modules, and 20 come from the podcast, and 50 come from the uh, lectures. They take a look at it and say, okay, how did, how did our students perform across our delivery methods? Are they performing about the same? Is there a delivery method that's working better or worse than others? And so you can start to take a look at how effective you are at implementing these other delivery methods. And then the other thing, and this one is one of the hardest ones and something we ran into, was as we put in more podcasts and more e-learning modules and took some of the kind of factoid lectures and instead of making them, you know, just the regurgitated content in the classroom, we took those things and we moved them into e-learning and podcasts and we put the more dynamic things and application level things and those things became taking up all of the classroom time was the shift that we were desiring to make. Sometimes as we looked at the performance of these of the content, 
that was covered in these different delivery methods, we would see, okay, this is really poor. Now, making the differentiation, though, between this is really poor on the whole or this one in particular is really poor is a harder thing to do. And so being able to compare and say, well, the content from this particular podcast performed poorly, but podcasts on the whole, content that came from podcasts on the whole, performed completely up to the class average. So now we don't have a podcast problem. We have a this piece of content in a podcast problem. We can go kind of target that and, and address it a little bit more specifically. Reordering your content can have some different issues. Um, some of them, and, and you notice the lists are shrinking here because some of them are very common and the same as what I've listed for some of the other forms of curricular redesign. But as you're rearranging your curriculum, there's some unintentional consequences. Um, over the years, curriculums almost fall into a rhythm uh, based on that, that repetition that it always is done in the same order, in the same way, and there becomes dependencies. And you get this domino effect and where you could change where a piece of content is taught, rearrange it, move it to later in the curriculum, move it earlier in the curriculum, and what you don't realize at first is that, oh, well, the way something else was taught was dependent on the students knowing and understanding this. Now, they don't have to be linked, but they happen to be linked because of the way your curriculum has been run for 10 years. So that person knows that so-and-so in their lecture always talks about this topic, and so they're using that topic as the example for some other piece of learning in their, in their courses. And so you end up with this, I moved this piece later in the curriculum so the students had a better understanding before they got there, or I moved this earlier in the curriculum because it's not as difficult, and next thing you know, things that you didn't change, things that you didn't alter at all, are having performance issues, either up or down, you never know, but it could be anywhere. And so it, you, you get this domino effect and these unintentional consequences, and being able to identify those things quickly is really important, and it's a challenge to do that. And then the other thing is you do all this rearranging, which can cause a lot of pain, and you have to make, especially if you've got team team taught courses or 20 or 30 faculty members in a block that all teach under maybe a block leader, well, you avoid all the collateral damage, which is hard enough to do, and lots of collaboration is necessary to do that, then you have to stop and take a look back and say, okay, we did all of this crazy amount of work. Did anything actually improve? Did we accomplish what we were looking for? And so if you start monitoring that performance of the related material via that category and item performance, you can kind of make some just-in-time tweaks to compensate for those things. You can start parsing out specific performance data to the changes you made to compare to the intention. I'll give you a couple of examples. One of the things that we did was moved our immunology, microbiology, host defense, we called it stuff, from earlier in our first year of our curriculum to the last thing in our second year of our curriculum. Uh, it, was a, it was an area that's always been a real struggle point for students, they struggled on the boards on it, always one of our lowest performing areas, despite some really great educators doing work there, and so we moved it later. And what we found was, oh hey, when they got into cardiology, there were some things that they didn't know anymore. And so that affected how they had to be taught in cardiology or, oh, you know what, we didn't actually address that in time. Cardiology is now coming past and we didn't make those adjustments. So now that we can see that from this data, we can add some things in and tweak how we do that last block of the curriculum, throw some review in, whatever it might be. There was a lot of different things we did to compensate for these unintentional effects and then we could make note and fix them moving forward. So. That's a lot of just text after text after text of text, or slide after slide after slide of text, excuse me. And it was a lot of me just yammering. Let me show you some of these reports and some of what it actually looks like to break this stuff down. Now, this is actually a, we just released a new version of this report that's a lot prettier. Um, but this is an example of a post-exam report in an integrated course. There's an ended block exam. There's a lot of different um, subject areas represented within that exam because it's integrated, a little bit of a capstone type thing. And so the student can see their strength and weakness on each one of these things. But again, those ends are pretty low. And so they'll, they'll know and you'll know how they're doing in that particular block on each of those subject areas when you're integrating that curriculum. But they're not necessarily the end all be all statistic because they are such a small number now that everything is taught in little pieces across that integrated curriculum. This is our student longitudinal performance. And so now they can start to see, okay, you know, back here it was just how did I do in each of these subject areas. But on this one, I've now started to pile some things up. I've got 242 neural questions, 140 musculoskeletal skin um, ones, 
52 in biology, 75 in, in history, it's histology. You know, anatomy's got 100. Now I'm starting to build up across all of these assessments um, some performance. Now, some of them are still low because I've only had one or two assessments in them. Cardio, GI system, we haven't really gotten there yet at this stage of the curriculum. But they can take a look at it and say, okay, here's how I'm performing, here's how the class is performing, here are the areas I really need to work on, and here are the areas that I'm actually doing okay, and I don't need to uh, you know, be as concerned about. And this live updates. So every time a student takes an exam, these sliders are going to update, and it's going to reflect the new assessment metrics. Additionally, we've got item analysis. You can take a look at these items year over year and say, you know, item one and item seven are actually the same item. And it was item one in the old version of the exam in the old curriculum, and uh, it's item seven in the new version of the exam in the new curriculum. And I went from about 100% of the class getting it right to 66% of the class getting it right. It's discriminating well, but I, I actually took something that used to be a mastery level thing for my students, and I've downgraded it to uh, a discriminating thing. Why am I do? Why are my students performing more poorly? You don't want to necessarily say they're performing more poorly on an entire subject off of one item, but you can start to pick out these things and look for trends that way. Same thing with the example below. These are two items that were identical items. They 22 was from the old curriculum exam, 34 was from the new curriculum exam. So I took something where people were really struggling. It discriminated. About half my upper students got it right, compared to only 27% of my lower students getting it right in the old curriculum, and. 36% of my overall students, but if you look at the last item there, it's a, or 34 in the new curriculum, I've shifted that up dramatically. It still discriminates, but it discriminates even better. I've got 90% of my top students getting it, which you want way more of your top students getting it than 52%, and I've still got 56% of my bottom getting it, so I up the number of students at the bottom who understand, but to, that's to the point where I've lost all discrimination, and overall the item shifted from 36% right to 71% right. So, it improved in the ways that we were looking for it to improve, and so you can take a look at these things. So I said we lived this. Let me show you a couple of examples of where we started. This right here is an export of our longitudinal data in our old version of the curriculum. And there were a few different things that really kind of jumped out at us as we looked at this. And we said, wow, we've got some gaps here. If you look at how our students are performing on recall questions, as opposed to how our students are performing on higher level blooms questions, clinical science vignette, application level questions, we've got a, a good 3% gap consistently across our entire curriculum in these things. And when looking at individual students, that gap is sometimes much, much higher. The other thing we took a look at was the number of questions. And we said, you know, we knew we were probably biased a little bit in the direction of recall questions, but we had no idea that when we actually sat down and categorized every single question, what we were going to see was almost 1,500 in the recall area and only 437 in the clinical science vignette area. You know, two to one, one and a half to one ratio, we would have we would have expected a little bit. But wow, holy, you know, geez, we are at three to one ratio here. That's that's bad because all of the board questions are in that vignette style and that higher level thinking. Same thing when you took a look at how much time we were spending on normal processes versus abnormal processes and some of the performance gap here and the, the gap in how much we were assessing it. So we took this and as part of our curriculum, we our curriculum reform, we did kind of all of the above, all the different things that I was talking about. We took certain things that we've been integrated, but we integrated more things. So anatomy and, and um, medical humanities were things that were really not integrated in our old curriculum, even though it was called an integrated curriculum and it was organ system based. We took those things, we spread them throughout the entire curriculum. So we had that issue to, to deal with, was integrating content. We also made the switch from a regular curriculum to a competency-based curriculum. So we're making that big switch all at the same time. We also made a very large um, switch in our distribution method. We took over 50% of our content and moved it to podcasts and e-learning modules that used to be in lectures. We had a clinical reasoning and integration sessions, uh, and we, we had to account for making time for things like anatomy in every single block and some pro section, some dissection instead of all dissection and so on. And so we changed delivery method, what content was in what delivery method, huge shifts in those things as well. At the same time, the board was raising its passing standards and reforming some of the curriculum or some of the content that was part of those exams. So we tried to incorporate kind of every one of the major themes I've talked about into our curricular reform. We did some of those things well, we did some of those things poorly, but this is where we started. Let me show you a little bit about where we ended up. 
this is one of our competency breakdowns that our students would receive. And if you take a look at it, you would see now instead of just being a bunch of subject areas, a bunch of assessments, everything's been kind of parsed out into different competencies and what competencies are. We pulled the pieces and parts um, uh, that pertain to each competency into those competencies. So if you look at our OSCEs, they're where part of our OSCE had to do with patient care and part of our OSCE had to do with interpersonal communication. And so we only attributed the items from the OSCE that students were being rated on communication to communication. Same thing with uh, the patient care and professionalism. Some of the things we found were really a threshold item. So we're not gonna put a score to it, but let's make sure we're meeting a threshold and make sure they've met or we make sure we're monitoring whether they've met or not met that threshold for that thing within that competency. Then obviously the, the scores themselves are important. So this was page one of a, of a three-page report that the students would get. So they could see whether or not they met the competency, which individual part of the competency caused them to miss it or not make, uh, or make it, and then comments over here if they did miss something. If you look at this next step, as was earlier in the curriculum, you'll notice some of these ends are a lot lower because it's the end of the first year rather than the end of the whole curriculum. But we take a look at that same data that we were looking at before, question types, general areas, and subject areas, and we notice a couple of things. One we've been able to close our gaps. Instead of a 3% gap between recall and application, we've got a 0.2% gap, you know, basically indistinguishable. So we, we accomplished our goal of increasing their ability to apply information and make sure they can clinically reason better, and things along those lines. We also closed the gap a little bit. Um, with If you take all our vignette questions here, there's about 210 of them or so, 220 compared to almost 400 recall questions, not where we want to be at all, but still better, still not three to one, we've lowered it to two to one, okay? And you know, over the course of time, working on making that ratio better and better. Um, same thing if you take a look at our normal and abnormal processes, a 0.07% difference in the class performance there, and the, the number of items are almost identical, and that was previously a two to one difference. So being able to have these things and have them early on was really helpful. Because we, we would look at this and we would say, hey, great, you know, this is the change we were looking for. This is something that, um, you know, we were really working on these particular items. We know what we wanted to change. We knew our intentions. We were able to measure against them. And then if you take a look at areas and say, okay, where are we not performing where we wanted to? It doesn't reflect it in this report. But one of the things that we found looking at this report even earlier than the version I'm showing you here is we actually were really struggling with that anatomy integration. So as great as we had done at closing the gap on the clinical understanding and application stuff and, and changing some of those ratios and closing those things, we had tried to integrate anatomy across all the blocks. And one of the things that we had done was taken all of the anatomy kind of pre-dissection lectures away. And they'd been replaced with either e-learning modules or like readings that students would have to do, self-directed learning type things that they would just do those self-directed learning things, go into the lab, do the dissection and move on with life. Well, we took a look at the performance and we started seeing anatomy, which was something that would perform around 85-ish percent longitudinally within our old curriculum, was performing around 65 percent. And we look at the course evaluations and the professor evaluations and we're like, oh, hey, we're getting a lot of kickback in these evaluations here that says they really hate the way we're doing anatomy. And so we looked into the evaluations for what they wanted, what they were felt like they were missing. And we found we had to take some of those, you know, help them understand what they were going to do in dissection lectures and put them back in. And so what you actually see here is kind of the results of them. If you look at gross anatomy and embryology, it's at 79% um, for the curriculum so far in this report. It was at 65% when we found the, the issue via this report and via the evaluations, we made the change. And while we're not back up to where we wanted to be yet and where we were in our old curriculum with anatomy, we've at least been able to show, okay, the, the changes we're making, the tweaks we're making on the fly, are working, they are fixing this. And so as we as we looked forward, rather than having to wait for all of our students to get to the boards and then struggle really, really badly on anatomy and have that be an area that us as a school got, a, you know, a school report from the boards that said, oh, you, your students were well below the national average in this. We, we were able to correct for that on the fly. It never got to be a huge issue. It was never something that we, were, we developed these huge gaps that we had to overcome. We knew because we were able to real-time monitor this stuff. So with that, I'm going to stop and take some questions here. Hopefully, you've been tossing some into the uh, question window as we go. So if you haven't, feel free to toss them in there. And so like we get about 12 minutes here. I'll try and get through as many as I can during that time. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. We appreciate that presentation. Um, again, just in case, if you do have a question for Eric, now is the time to type it into the questions area of the GoToWebinar control panel, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Type those in. We're going to go ahead and read them out and try to get through as many as we can in the next couple of minutes. Um, let's just jump right in. Eric, the first question we have is, We've changed so much in our curricular redesign that it, we are going to have to track lots and lots of different categories. Is there a limit on the number of categories or outcomes you can put on a question or in an exam? No, there's definitely not. There's no limit when it comes to rubrics or when it comes to the questions or exams. Uh, and, and that's a really important point because there is so much that gets changed during curricular redesign uh, that you have a lot you have to track. Uh, you know, we probably had seven to ten categories on every question by the time we were said and done. Um, there's a couple of things there that I want to, different constituencies need different things. And part of that ability to tag as many things as you need is that your curriculum review committee might need certain categories. Your students for board preparation and feedback on exams might need other categories. Your faculty might want other categories still and then you've got your competencies and your, uh, your institutional learning standards and your institutional level outcomes and those sorts of things. So not any single group of categorizations might necessarily fit the needs of every constituency, but you can put as many as you need on there so that you can release reports and say, okay, I'm only going to include these categories to the students because that's all they care about. But I'm going to include these other categories when I send it to my faculty because they care about these other things. One of the things I said I would mention and I never got around to and, and kind of related to this, if you're using us already or if you're considering using us, one thing to know is you don't have to have this all done right up front. If you've been using us for years but you've never categorized your questions, you can go back and categorize your questions and you will get retroactive data. You will get data going back to the very first instance that item was ever used on an assessment and to the very first student who ever took it. So if you've been with us for three or four years and now you're doing curricular redesign, you're like, shoot, I wish I had this baseline data. If you go ahead and categorize now, you'll actually kind of instantly populate for yourself the baseline data that you would need. Now, if you're somebody who's looking at curricular redesign and you're not a client, jump on board. You're in the middle of doing your curricular redesign, probably not a great time to go categorize thousands of questions, but that's okay. If you just start giving the assessments through the system, you can go back, like I was saying to the other people, and get that data later. So you might not have time while you're in the middle of your curricular redesign right now, but you may have time later. And so if you start using us, you're not losing that data. You begin to capture it regardless of when you start categorizing. Perfect. Thank you so much, Eric. We actually had had several people pose that question uh, during your presentation, so I'm glad that you touched on that. Um, but yes, uh, the specific uh, question that we had was, if I set all this up and then go through a curricular revision down the road, do I lose all of that data? And so just to reiterate, no, all of that data can be retroactively gathered. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so next question we have is, Many of the things we would want to track would be for internal purposes only. Some we would want to share performance with our students and some not. Do we have the ability to choose which ones are included on student reports and which ones aren't? Absolutely. There's filters available on all the reports when you choose to release them. So you could choose what categories and competencies and whatever else are included and not included. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next question we have is what type of LMS, what, I'm sorry, what type of LMS systems are you compatible with at this time? We have integrations with uh, Blackboard, with Desire to Learn, and we're rolling out a new one with Canvas uh, at, here at the end of the year. As far as those integrations go, uh, you can move courses and rosters of students. So if uh, if you basically, if you turn it on your LMS system, that course is going to automatically appear in our system. Then that roster of students would be created in our system and placed into that course. And when you're done with the assessments, you can actually export those grades back to the grade books in the LMS. Uh, so uh, the desire to learn one is completed and we're finalizing our last stage of testing and that'll be released in January. Our Canvas one is still in progress, but that one should be released by January as well. And our Blackboard one is already out there. Uh, and that one's been out there for a little while now. So. If you're not with one of those three, we have some other things we can still do. We can do some things using LTI and single sign-on to make it a common username and password, allow you to pass back and forth 
uh, you're you're logged into the LMS and it just passes you directly into our system without having to re-log in. Uh, and we have a customizable grade export. So uh, different systems, some people have homegrown systems or maybe you're with Moodle or Sakai or one of those other LMSs. Um, they have a specific format that they need data imported in. And it might be certain column names and certain column orders and things like that. And so uh, one of the things that we allow you to do is create those templates inside of our system so that when you're going to export data, you can export it into the template that whatever system you're using needs so that you don't have to move all that stuff around and rename columns and all that sort of stuff. So uh, even if you're not with uh, Desire Learn Blackboard or Canvas, we do have some options available for you, uh, but those are the best three options we have. Great, thank you. Um, this is the last question that I have in the bucket right now. Uh, last call for questions, if anybody wants to add one in. Um, last question I have is, what is the upfront workload like to get this set up? Do I need a dedicated admin or could faculty run this? You know, we've got a really solid split on that with our client base. I would say a third to a half would do uh, an admin who runs all this stuff for them. A uh, third to a half would do um, the faculty doing it 100% themselves. And I guess that other third would be a hybrid where they have some admin help, but they also do some of the things themselves. Um, when I was with Ohio State, I was in the position of doing it all. We had a, a program coordinators and things like that who would take the assessments, put them into the system, tag the categories. Faculty would actually have to tag the, ca the categories to the questions either in Word or whatever, but then we would take them and put them into the system for them. Uh, and we do the exporting of data and things along those lines. Um, but I work with lots and lots of clients who have faculty do 100% of that process. Um, there's always a little bit of pain for the long-term gain. You know, getting questions into any system uh, can sometimes have its hiccups, but we've got a really nice question importer and some filters that help you reformat your questions and get them into our system, uh, which makes it a little bit unique and a little bit smoother of a process than maybe what you've incurred elsewhere. Um, but there's definitely some upfront investment, but what we try to do, things like the categorization being retroactive, we try not to put it all up front. So because you can categorize later, maybe you get your, your questions in and do all your assessments in the system over the course of the first year, and then over that summer after the first year, you go back and categorize everything. Um, that way you can kind of distribute that workload. And then sometimes it takes, you know, once you get all those questions in, the next year you don't have to spend the time doing that, so the time you would have spent with those questions, maybe you spend that on editing them and refining them and doing quality improvement, or maybe that's when you go back and categorize or tweak categorization. So um, you can spread it out, and the system's got some tools in there to help you with that. Thanks, Eric. We just got an influx of questions, so we're going to try and get through these last couple of questions really quickly. We're going to run out of time. If we do not get to your question, uh, we will follow up with you. Eric uh, will have a record of everybody's posed questions and can follow up by email, so please don't worry. But let's run through um, a couple just as quickly as possible. Uh, Eric, question, can the data be imported to Excel? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, all of our data is exportable in a bunch of different forms, uh, comma delimited, tab delimited, um, straight up Excel file. Uh, we give you the data in all the raw ways, so if you want to take it and put it in another system or use SPSS or anything else to work with that data, you're absolutely free to do that. Great. Next question. Can this be started with just one course rather than the entire curriculum? Absolutely, and we frequently see that. Um, you know, you maybe just have a couple of more technologically interested faculty, um, or you know, somebody who's got maybe particular problems in their course that they're really intent on solving, and so they do it first, kind of show everyone else, hey, this is the data I'm getting, this is the progress I'm making, this is what the progress lo process looks like for me, and kind of help get that buy-in. If you're worried about getting faculty buy-in, you can start with maybe one course and let it organically spread a little bit. Great. All right. Last question we're going to have time for. Were you able to use these data to predict students' performance in board exams, and what variables were mostly correlated with board exams? Absolutely. Um, what we found when we started using the longitudinal analysis was, as we looked through our, you know, 30-some assessments that we were doing, block exams and midterms and so on, that certain categories were a much higher level of predictor than what we used to use used to take the student scores in the first two years of the curriculum and kind of rank the students. And anybody who, and, and we looked at our failures on the board, what we would find is that the failures on the board when you rank the students by their total score in the curriculum would be spread out amongst the bottom 50 or so ranks in the class. 
And what we did was we started looking at the category performance and we found that when we looked at those clinical science vignette questions or those higher level blooms application board style questions, um, that they were a much better predictor, not a surprise given how many recall questions we had that were kind of making our signal fuzzy, they were a much better predictor of student performance. And so when we ranked our failures, we ranked this class by performance on that question type, I should say, and then we plugged in the failures, those 10 or so failures were in the bottom 12 ranks when you rank them by that question type. So that gave us a much more targeted group, a, a, a easier group to work with. You know, it's hard to really meaningfully intervene with 50 students, but to interview with 12, we can do that. And so we did design some intervention programs. We used all the other data we were getting to help create study schedules and get tutors based on specific subject areas. Um, and we offered this intervention out to all 12 of our bottom performing students in that category for the next few years. And what we saw was that each of those three years, um, and again, I'm not at Ohio State anymore, so I don't know what it's been like since, but during the three years I was there while we were doing this intervention, of the 12 students we offered it to, two of them turned us down every year. The two who turned us down every year failed the boards. The 10 who took us up on the intervention all passed. So we were ma making meaningful improvement even at the end of our curriculum. We weren't really identifying this until later on. We could see hints of it earlier and we'd try our best to address it then, but in reality, we were sitting down at the end of Med 2 and they were about to take their, their USMLE Step 1, and we were saying, okay, here's the bottom 12, let's try and intervene in these six weeks before they take the board, and we were successfully able to do so. So unfortunately for those students who opted out, they failed, it made a nice control group for our study, uh, and then we started releasing this information to the class as a whole and saying, okay, hey, everybody, use this to help guide your studying. We saw significant increases in our um, average performance on the boards as well. So uh, this really can be effective board performance and other things, and not just um, when it comes to curricular overhaul. Perfect. Thanks so much, Eric. All right, we're going to wrap things up there, folks. It is 3 o'clock exactly. That almost never happens. Thank you again so much for taking time out of your busy day uh, to join us for today's uh, presentation. Again, everything is being recorded. We will be shooting out a link to the recording of the webinar here in the next few days, so please look for that in your inboxes, and feel free to share it with any peers or colleagues that weren't able to attend the live presentation. Uh, also, just again, a reminder, when you close out of this uh, webinar, you will get a pop-up for a brief survey. We would really appreciate it if you would take those 30 seconds to uh, answer those five quick questions so we can continue to provide relevant content. Thanks again. Really appreciate uh, everybody's attendance.